Wise Wednesdays started on April 1st with a humble episode on forgiveness. Between then and now, we've had heart-led conversations on happiness, stress management, relationships, resilience, public speaking, respecting boundaries, self-discovery, mindset, just being, listening, reclaiming your life, intuition, and even food. I would like to thank all my listeners and the guests who gave me their time and trust. It is because of you that we kept going. It is because of you that we kept growing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much for joining us on episode 85 of Wise Wednesdays with RK. My, ho- my guest for today is someone who is called the world's topmost modeler. He, his name is John Leonard. He is a chemist, a chemical engineer, the co-owner of the technology and consulting company Flosis. And he is focused on helping people finding flow, helping people flow, which is not just the only thought process that's damaging. It's been called the essence of leadership. All of this allows John to dissolve problems and create generative results. He is fascinating. I was on a call with him a few days ago. And before I knew it, I was sure he had to be my guest on the show and I am truly truly honored that he said yes so without further ado I bring to you John hi Uka how you doing I'm good how are you thank you thank you welcome to the conversation well thank you for having me on the show Lovely. So we are today very uh, discussing something really, really interesting. We are talking about the reality of how your brain works. Like, really, how does your brain work? Uh, that is something a lot of us have wondered on good times and bad. So tell us a little before even getting into the topic. Tell us first about yourself, please. Well, um, as you said, I'm a chemist and chemical engineer. And what I am mostly is a modeler. I have all these models, and one of the models is about the brain. So I wore my brain shirt because we're going to talk about the brain. We'll talk about that this time. But um, so I basically try to help people become more themselves. One of the big misconceptions is when I help people, I'm not trying to turn them into me. I'm trying to turn them into more of them. And then that's why, you know, the people that do work with me, I get a lot of wonderful testimonials because people are shocked. They're like, I became more myself by dealing with John rather than becoming more him or more somebody else. So that's what I really do because I understand how the mind and brain works. I help people understand who they are and then I help them bring more of that out to help other people. Hmm. And, and as you say that, the the question that comes to my mind is a lot of times we're being somebody else aren't we right we're we're surrounded by people and so even just growing up we we even as babies we're we're absorbing all the information and somehow we're getting conditioned so how do you then help people connect with who they are well we have a test that we give them uh to figure that out real specifically but i love what you just said because if you think about it what i found is it at about nine years old, kids are uh, intrinsically motivated for a reward. So the example I always give, because I go into classrooms and I'll, I'll, I'll go to these kids and I'll say, in America, they're third graders. I'll say, what's the capital of, and I'll name a state like South Dakota. Every kid will raise their hand and every kid will guess. Cause, and I'll say, if I'll give you a candy bar. They'll all guess and they, and they want to get a candy bar. And if they guess and they're wrong, They want to guess again. All of a sudden in fourth grade, when they hit 10, they're extrinsically motivated to to avoid a negative, to avoid a punishment. So they just sit there. You do that with a class of 10-year-olds, and they're just like, I'm not answering. I'm not answering unless I know I'm right. And even if they think they're right and they get it wrong, they won't guess again. So I like to look at one of the things, like, for instance, who did you what did you want to do when you were like eight or nine what did you imagine you were going to do in this world or or what did you want to do you know john 
my question is because I didn't have any dreams of my own. As it sounds like a sob story, but my mom wanted me to be a doctor. So I didn't think beyond that. It was like I had blinders on where, you know, oh, wow. it, I was just, this is, this is who I'm going to be because this is what my mom wants me to be. This is what my parents want me to be. That's how it went on. It's only much later in life that I decided to take them off and explore the world of words. So, so even at like six, seven, eight, there wasn't anything you naturally wanted to do. You were wait. Okay, now that you've taken me further back, uh, six, seven, eight. I think I always enjoyed teaching because I do remember propping up. <laughs> I do remember propping up pillows in front of the in front of my uh, in front of the wall and pretending to be a teacher. I had my own chalk and my duster. Oh my God, what am I sharing? But yes, I had my own chalk and duster. I would write on my white walls so that. Nobody could see that I was writing with a white chalk. I'd clean it, I'd pretend to be a teacher, and I would teach the pillows the questions that I had to learn. Well, wow. <laughs> There's so many <laughs> great things in there. See, what I like to do is I like to explain to people how the mind and brain works so they know why what they did is working so they could do it again. So one of the things you just said that's amazing is, is we only learn 25% of information directly. So that's why when you ever you learn something new, they tell you you have to repeat it three times. Well, think about it. Mm -hmm. You have to learn it and repeat it three times. So you only learn 25% and you mm -hmm. have to repeat it. When you teach information, you learn it 75%. So mm -hmm. at that young age, this is so this is interesting because there are these different types of people in who you are. We call them intangible drivers. One of those types is a teacher and hmm. a teacher is focused on the why, why this happens, why that happens. And teachers like to explain things. I am a, what's called an administrative teacher. I like to explain things and people who are teachers tend to be smarter, not because they're geniuses, not because of their, their background or anything, but because we want to tell everybody what we learned. So I learn something and then I want to teach it because that gives me energy. That's who I am. And the act of me teaching made me smarter. We could all be smarter if we acted like teachers. So one of the issues is, is you got this like really well, six, seven and eight. It made you smarter. That act made you smarter. That's one of the things I do in the schools to help kids learn stuff three times quicker is I'll, I'll show these teachers. If you have the kids teach, what they're learning, it makes them smarter. You did it yourself. Well, I'm, I'm going to take your mom's side here for a second. Boy, if I have a daughter who is really, really smart, why wouldn't she be a doctor? Yeah. So I you could, you can mentally do the doctor job, but who you are, you wouldn't get energy. And there's nothing sadder than being really good at something that doesn't give you energy. So here'd be the second question I'd ask you. Hmm. Why did you want to teach people? Why did you want to teach? Did you want those people to just be aware? Did you want them to understand? Did you want to, to, give, to help them so that they weren't having issues? Did you want them to be excited? Like when you teach, what's the response you want back from somebody? Well, I really don't think it was that deep. It was more of me okay i'm a single child okay. so i i didn't have siblings or anybody to play around with or stuff and and when it came to studies i had to score well so for me i just saw those pillows as someone who was listening to me because i think i've always been a chatterbox uh so um yes i would i would speak to them i would share them and when i would reply back with the answers or you know like Obviously, the pillows wouldn't answer to me. When I would be able to prompt up the answers, I would feel that, oh, great, I've learned it. So it would just take away all the irritating, boring part of science and social studies, which I didn't really want to read from a book and learn. It would bring a fun element to it for myself. So, Wow. That, you are so <laughs> intuitive. And again, I, you told me the story of how you created Smile. And that it was very much an unconscious brain event and you having the courage to follow your unconscious brain, which is where all our energy behavior is. Now you, that story just explained it even more. 
is that you were aware learning this stuff for the sake of learning was boring, but you made a game out of it. Yeah, and it's, it's you know, I've never really explored this and I'm so happy you're asking me these questions because um, I've when I've explained things to my children growing up, uh, even to my nieces and nephews, they're like, you've taught this to us so well that even now grade three and four questions we, you can wake us in the middle of the night and we will tell them to you with actions. I used to teach with actions. So they're like, Ma, we cannot erase that from our mind. So yeah, makes sense now. Thank you. So so <laughs> did you, so what is the response you want from people today? So when you, when you teach them something, do you want to say, do you want them to say, I feel better? Do you want them to say, um, wow, now I'm able to do this thing. Do you want me to say, do you want someone to say, this is great. You know, what is, what is the response that gives you energy when you teach something today? I like it when people take action. See, I think you and I might be the same uh, uniqueness. I'm an administrator teacher. So that, what that means is the administrator is the effect I want to have on other people. I want to help people get in the right relation to the project or other people. I care about where they are in relation to other things and how I do it as I teach, I explain. Hmm. And so administrators love to make games out of everything. Yes. So yeah. how many kids did you have? A little Two. kid? Two little kids? Well, nope. Um, my, my kids now? Yeah. 25 and 22. Okay. Yeah. So they were, so but they, they were little. So you had, you had yeah. little kids. So they were, they were pretty little. You, when I, see, I had three and I loved making everything into a game for them. That's what mm -hmm. I did. And so did you like make games? Did you create any games for them? I did create games for them. This, this almost looks like I'm being interviewed, but this is fun. This is definitely well, well, this fun. Is so interesting because, <laughs> yeah. because you're so unconscious. You're, you're, you're what I call a truth savant. You're doing the truth, but you can't explain it. And then what I like mm -hmm. to do, you're actually giving me a chance to do what I do is, is mm -hmm. I'm dealing with someone like you who really know, is doing the right things, but I'm going to show you why what you're doing is so good. So could okay. you tell me one of the games you invented? Okay. And uh, my, ch my son has a long name. His name is Muhammad Abdullah Khan. And he, at age four, to remember that spelling was hard for him. So you know where I'm going with this. I created a, a musical name for him <laughs> so that he could spell it out. So, so he's, he's, if he catches this replay, he's going to go, Ma, what did you do? But anyway, so it was M-O-H-D dot A-B-D-U-L-L-A-H-K-H-A-N. And that's it. And, and, you know, there would be times when he would take a paper to write his assignment, his homework, grade one, he'd have coloring or whatever. And you always have to fill in your name. And I would watch him as he would fill his name. His head would go. Nah, nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> and he got his name right. So I, I bet you when you bring it up, he's going to smile. Cause oh, yes, he will. Now, do you, do you uh, I mean, play any musical instruments? No, I don't. And and I, you know, those were that time I didn't even I wasn't even into personal development or anything. It was just something I did again instinctively. So I so I don't that. play any instruments either. And I did the same thing with my kids. I made up songs about everything they had to do. And and I used to like to say, I still say this, I am the greatest bad songwriter in the world. <laughs> and so my kids to this day, they're like they start singing these songs and they go, oh, I can't get this song out of my head. It's like, because they're catchy. They're good. Yeah. But they're not nothing nobody else wants to hear. But yeah, so I did that a lot. I wrote a lot of little songs for my kids to do mm -hmm. certain things. Yeah. But that's how you learn. If You know, so one of the things I'll, I'll teach us about the brain really quickly is that, you know, in your brain is a, is a dendrite. It's a tree. And so the, the, the trunk is a word. You know, so like you could have the word like the word song and then we have all these connecting facts and associated emotions with it. Well, what happens is anytime you learn a new fact, when you teach somebody the word, you're creating a dendrite in their brain with that word and you give them the definition. And so you're 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 building a branch. If you keep teaching, you make the emotion bad and you make the branch small. 
the second step is the key to teaching. The minute you give a definition and explain a new concept, you got to go away from that tree and make them apply it. So a song, mm -hmm. a story, anything away from it, because then when they come back to the tree to use it, they have a happy emotion and it builds the branch thicker. So you think about it, whenever I teach teachers how to teach them, you know, this concept, because a lot of them do it. I'm showing them why the, some of these teachers, their kids are so much better, you know, growing so much more than others. It's, and I'll show them, it's because you give the, the concept, the definition, and you immediately make a story, make a song, t you know, tell a story, apply it, and the branch is getting thicker in the second step versus everybody else is making the branch thinner. So that's why, so your kids must be uh, doing pretty good, huh? They must be pretty smart. I'm not doing that. Yes, I am, <laughs> proud, of them. I am proud of them. <laughs> nice. This is great. So we have we have people watching us. We have Kunen watching us who says he likes your, the T-shirt you're wearing and he'd like to know where to get it. A friend of mine got this for me uh, in a museum in Arizona. They came back and said, I got, I saw some and I was thinking of you and they, they uh, got me the shirt. So I wasn't even, it was a gift from somebody. So thank you. I love the shirt too. I love walking into classrooms with the shirt on. The kids are like, and then that's everybody that. remembers, oh, that's the brain guy. I remember the brain guy. The brain guy. I like that. So when did you decide to become the brain guy? What was it that was, what was it that led you to become the brain guy? I was working for a company and they had an electric air freshener, an air freshener that plugged in the wall. It worked for 45 days and all the consumers said they couldn't smell it after 21. And so they asked me to figure out why, as being a modeler, why that happened. And I found out, I came up, I ended up coming up with a model for the nose and the brain, how it's connected um, in humans. So an animal doesn't have that problem. An animal will smell it forever. So there's, there's two things. When you first walk into a room, after 21 minutes, you can't smell the room anymore. That's called adaptation. Yeah. If you walk into the same room 21 days in a row, you can no longer smell it anymore. That's habituation. So they were asking me, what, why does habituation occur in humans and not in animals? Hmm. And I figured out why it happens is our brain zeroes out that smell. And if you think about it, if it didn't, we would be thinking of all the smells and all the things going on. We couldn't have this conversation. So our brain actually works against us and it, it knocks down that smell. When I figured out the model, I noticed something that if you, and I don't have graphs here or anything, I'll just try to illustrate this. If you were to smell a smell every day in a row for 21 days, the first day you smell it, you would smell it at 60% because you can't really, us. we can't smell all the fragrance the first time we smell it the second day when you smell it it would appear to get stronger because you're learning it so it'd be 70 yeah. percent. the third day 80 fourth day 90 the fifth day 100 percent. now notice the fragrance never changed you think it's getting stronger you're just learning it yeah. on the sixth day your brain would smell it and go yeah that matches the profile so it starts to lessen it down to 21 days and then it's gone. So now think about this graph. As an engineer, I'm looking at this graph. How many days did you fully experience the reality of that fragrance? Hmm. So as an engineer, I'm like, wait a minute, this fragrance smelled this strong and I'm only gonna fully experience it one day? My brain yeah. isn't made to fully experience reality. That's the conclusion I came to 26 years ago. And it really kind of shocked me. I'm like, wait a minute. Why does everybody think our brain is the made to fully experience reality? And the more reality we get and the more effort we take and the more we do, we're going to be happier. And we see people crash. The first five days you're learning. If you look at happiness, the first five days you'd be happy every day. Then you'd lose a little happiness and then you'd stop being happy. Our brains are made to be happy if we can stay in the learning phase. So that was what I, what I learned 26 years ago is everybody's model for the brain is backwards. They think we're a conscious brain, we're a computer, and all that matters is you state a fact and you'll be happy. 
But like, like I said about the, the doctor, I know a woman, really smart woman, and she, when I met her, she's in her 40s, she was really down because she had gone to school to be a chemical engineer, like me, and she was the only woman in her class that year, that freshman year, to be a, a chemical engineer. She did it for two years, and then she quit. But she stayed friends with all those kids from college. She got into psychology. She got into the education system. That's where I met her. And she said, John, I, I'm still friends with all my friends on Facebook. They have nicer cars than I do. They go on nicer vacations than I do. But I wasn't tough enough to be a chemical engineer. And as I got to know her, I said to her, you are a chemical engineer. You have a brain. You're smart enough. But she's what I would call a compassion server. A lot of people in um, education are compassion server. And what that is, is compassion is they want to bear your pain. So, so if you meet people who, who say, when they walk in the room, they instantly know who's in the most pain. They, they just feel it. They don't even have to try. They're like, that person's in pain. And server is like a wild card. You can do any of the seven. So these people will do whatever it takes to bear your pain. That's who she is. And I told her, I said, if you're not a teacher in your how or your why, like you and I are both teacher hows, if you're not a teacher in your how and your why, you were never going to be an engineer. And so mm -hmm. it, you not being an engineer had nothing to do with your mental ability. It had everything to do with your energy and you being a human. You're not a robot. She said that was one of the most healing things. I've known her for three years now. She brings it up like every three to four months. That was the most healing thing that's happened in my life is to know who I am. I'm compassion server. And even if I'm, I'm, I'm smart enough to be an engineer as a human, you know, as a human, you wouldn't want to be a doctor. You know, you could be a doctor. But Good. you wouldn't, but you're a human. You wouldn't want to be. You wouldn't get energy. And that's what I learned about the brain is everybody has this model that the brain's a computer and you should just factually do what you need to do. And you can fix everything by factually telling everybody that. If you don't tell it to them in their uniqueness, it hmm. doesn't resonate. So that's when I learned that 26 years ago. And from there, I said, I'm going to start modeling the mind and the brain. And that's what I did. I did it. I help people get off antidepressants. I help people get off bipolar medication. I help people be happy because Beautiful. I understand the brain. But it's it all goes back to who you are in your uniqueness. Absolutely. And December 2019, I was in Kuwait. So I grew up in Kuwait and I was in Kuwait. I was invited by my school to come and present. So um, two two very important uh, things happened in Kuwait uh, that year. A, I was able to present in my school, the place where I would do my annual functions, like uh, the, the, the building, the actual auditorium was where I went and I presented my smile to, my, uh, to the students of that, uh, of that year, the high school students. And for me, it was beautiful. I mean, I think I can present anywhere in the world, but that takes the cake for me to, to present in my school, the same spot where I would do my annual functions to go and present. And the other one was when I presented my smile strategy at a hospital to medical staff. So I think the cherry on the cake of that trip was to actually have a selfie where you have all these doctors and other uh, attendants from the medical fraternity standing behind me in their in their respective uniforms and me taking a picture because I was the smile strategist and presented a smile to them. So that, that was awesome. Did you show that to your mom? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Oh, gosh. So yeah, yes. the, the smile strategy, I, I love it because, um, and I'm very, oh, go on. Uh, uh, but sorry, sorry to interrupt. But before you get into that, let's. I have a question. Let's look yeah. at that, and then let's jump into the smile. So there's a question. Uh, the question is, Kunan asks, what kind of activities do you suggest to dissolve violence in schools, home, and other places? Wow, that's an amazing question. You know, uh, two big things. That's that is an amazing question. So two big things are going on there. Um, one of the issues is self-esteem and self-esteem is confidence in your uniqueness. So it's two halves, confidence in your uniqueness. And in the United States, we spent all this time more than 20 years ago thinking self-esteem was just confidence. So we just told the kids, you're great. 
you're great, you're great, you're great. And what happened was all the kids were walking around feeling great, but they didn't do very good in school. They didn't mm -hmm. achieve very much, but the schools were safe. Now what's happened the last 20 years is we're going, nope, you need to be good. You need to get good grades. You need to do all this stuff. You need to, and so it's all this achievement stuff. And now these kids are not feeling safe anymore. You know, they're not feeling, you know, love. They're not feeling appreciated. They're not growing self-esteem. And now the schools are no longer safe. And in, in Great Britain, like three years ago, they said they're gonna go away from this achievement drive because it was turning teachers into data managers. Because again, they're treating the kids like robots. They're teaching the, treating the teachers like robots. And it made for bad citizens. So the thing that would help the most is if kids understand who they are and their uniqueness and then grow in it. And that's what I do in the schools is I, we have, like I said, we have this test and, and with the kids take it, they find out who they are. And I had a, I, had, I heard a story this past week um monday uh a person this is a 39 year old so a person gave this test to a 39 year old and they found out they were compassion server for ex an ex example and the, the the person the person who took the test said to the other person you're you're the same too right you care about people not being in pain right and he's like no he's an exhorter server he wants people to be excited about the future and he's like how could you not be that way? How could anybody not be that way? And it's like, that's what all these kids think. All these kids think everybody in the world sees the world the way I see it. Hmm. And, and the, there's two things that these kids learn is when they learn who they are, they realize, wait a minute, I see the world this way. Like you and I see the world as administrator teachers. We want to get everybody in the right position by explaining it to them. Who wouldn't want to do that? Who wouldn't want to go to a hospital and explain to everybody this so they're all the right position? You and I think everybody would want to do that. When we were kids, we thought everybody would do that. And you aligned the pillows. That's administrating. You aligned <laughs> all the pillows and taught them. I love, like I said, there was something about your story that just went, oh my goodness, that's me. When kids realize, wait, this is how I think and it's different than other people. And this is how you think. Oh, that's different than me you really start believing your uniqueness. So one of the things I talk about is, is understanding your uniqueness immediately will take you from no or low self-esteem right to mid self-esteem. And then high self-esteem is growing in that uniqueness. And the way you do it is, as I say to these kids, there's three stages, is the kids need to understand who they are. They need to embrace it. You know, when you and I grew up, if someone said to us, you guys are administrator teachers, and we go, no, we want to be server servers. Server servers can do anything. We want to be that. We would get trained. So we gotta we gotta embrace it. And then we gotta communicate it. And that's the power is we have preteens who fix their families. Because when they understand who they are, they start communicating to their parents who they are, then their surroundings start treating them that way. Then they start growing and then they start helping the parents and everybody's open to that. So I would say knowing embracing and understanding the second way to stop school shooting and i'm actually going to address this in january is i read this book linked it's 18 years old it's an amazing book it's a book about how everything in the world is connected not to everything else but within itself so here's how the government's connected here's how the economy's connected here's how the internet's connected here's how your body's connected here's how the social society's connected there's a language there. And because we don't understand the language, we talk about it so generally, it doesn't mean anything. I'm taking the information I got and applying it to the book linked. So I've started this hashtag beyond linked. And on LinkedIn and Facebook, I'm sharing this and I'm going really slow, but, but I'll jump you way ahead because it's such a great question. Everything it needs is either clusters or an island. So if you think of all the people, if you were to make all the, they're called nodes, if you were to make a dot for every kid in the school and you were to link every kid who knew every other kid, that's what, that's what the network would look like. And it would look like a mess. But if you understand that there's clusters and there's things called hubs and then there's islands, there's nodes that aren't connected to everything else, anything else. 
that's where your school shootings happen, is these kids who form what's called an island. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help people understand this language of how networks form so that when we look at a school, and, and it's funny that question came up because one of the things I'm going to address is this is what, how a school shooting happens. And it, it's all explained that you have a cluster and you have this island. And then in some cases, you have kids in the cluster bullying the island. Hmm. So these kids don't feel connected. And that's where a lot of people will kill themselves when they don't feel connected. And then, and they'll, and, and then if they're bullied, it's even worse. And the last thing I'll say about this is we call it intangible drivers who you are. Every person I know who's tried to commit suicide did it because they didn't think they were ever going to be who they are, who they were created to be. And the issue is, is I call it have, do, are. So I'll say to people, who are you? And they'll say, I'm a doctor. No, that's what you do. Oh, I'm a millionaire. No, that's what you have. Who are you? And the culture has it backwards. It, they'll say, if you have this, then you could do this and then you could be someone. And so when these kids, it's who you are allows you to do this and then you'll have this. When these kids think that who they are is what they're going to have or do and they go, well, I'm never going to be a rock star. I'm never going to be a millionaire. I might as well kill myself. When we teach them who they are, and this is not just kids, this is adults. They're like, oh, wait a minute. I can be who I am. And what that looks like, there's a lot of ways to do that. There's a lot of ways to be administrator, teacher. You have this show. I do my consulting. There's a lot of ways to be who I am. You're happiest when you get to be who you are. And so that's why it's really important to, to know who you are. And when we do that, none of these people ever want to come close to killing themselves again. And I've offered this. I've offered the people, I could show you how to, to stop the suicide thing. People know who they are. Everybody's got their own program. So, and I'm willing to do this for free. So, lovely. Okay, so I uh, hope that answers your question, Kunen. Great and uh, yes, yeah. uh, and okay, let's move into the smile then. And what was it about it that fascinated you? Yeah, so, and I'm going to be honest, I'm, I'm really hard on consultants because consultants, their, their strategy is conscious brain. Their strategy is you need to do more of this and you need to, what is it you want? Go get it. And you effort forward. And, I, and what I've seen is that, and, you, and people call it the law of attraction, but the more you pursue something, the more it eludes you. And there's mm -hmm. so many people who go, I want this thing. They go after it. It eludes them. Well, they go, I got to try twice as hard. So they start ignoring their kids and try twice as hard. And then they ignore their marriage and try twice as hard. And then they ignore their friends. And then 20 years later, they don't have it and don't have anything else. And yep. the thing is, is that the way things work is, is you should say what you want. So your unconscious hears it. And then you got to let go because it's your unconscious that will bring it to you. So if you understand how the brain actually works, your, your conscious brain, I like to say your conscious brain is like the cell phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I wanted to reach somebody across the room with the cell phone, there's two ways to do it. One is I could text them. And two mm -hmm. is I can throw it at them. If I throw it at them, I can reach them. But someday all this phone is going to be good at for is throwing it at people. This is your conscious brain. Are you using it to do this invisible thing, text? Or are you physically using it to do everything and wrecking it? And so mm -hmm. the people who really, what I do is I help people realize you use your conscious brain to direct your unconscious brain. And all these consultants are or they're helping people make you know momentary gains and then these people always end up a mess in the long term so when i saw your smile analogy i'll be honest i'm like oh here we go another consultant who's just wearing people out and is hurting people and then you know i read the first three and the first three is what everybody has you know science the mind you know because you, you got to get down to one thought manage your attention direct it that, absolutely, no one can argue about, about that. Identify your intention. Those first three, everybody says that. And then they either say nothing after that or they say, now go after it. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, I remember I'm watching your, 
your TED talk. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's got the same thing everybody else does. And then all of a sudden the L, you know, let things go. And I was like, uh oh, whoa. Did I like, I have to rewind that. Did I see that right? Let things go. That's the unconscious brain. See, when you, the, the reality is this, is there are opportunities passing you by all the time and your unconscious brain can map them out and seize them. But your unconscious brain doesn't know what you're thinking until you say it out loud or you write it down. So if you have these intentions and you never say it, your unconscious brain is just aware of it. The minute you say, you know, identify your intentions, either writing or saying, I want to be a teacher. I want to do this. Your unconscious brain goes, oh, well, I've seen tons of opportunities. I'll, I'll let you know. And that's why all of a sudden it's like, oh, the law of attraction, the universe. The, your unconscious brain is 90% of your brain. It's nine times bigger than that conscious brain you're trying to do everything through. Your unconscious brain is a better computer than we will ever create as humans. Do you know how to use it? So stating that intention and letting it go, your unconscious brain sees it. And when you look at it, it communicates to you through emotions. Your unconscious brain doesn't talk in words. It's emotions. emotions. And if you're good at feeling that settles me, that doesn't settle me. And so when you told me the story, I mean, you tell me the story about how you did smile. You didn't consciously, I'm going to do this research. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. So I don't wait for being ready. I don't wait till I'm ready till, till I take up an opportunity and, and you know do something about it. So I knew I wanted to present on the TEDx stage. Trained speaker, no. Orator, Toastmaster, nothing. But the opportunity was what I was looking for. I think I spoke to my unconscious and then- You, it, out, you stated the intention, exactly. Yeah, I stated the intention and then there it presented itself. And then I'm wondering, I know what I want to do. I know what, a, what I want to deliver as an idea, but I don't have a script in place. So I literally sat down with myself and I looked up into the air and I said, hey, excuse me, you've given me this opportunity. Now give me something to present. Now I know what the big picture is going to be, but give me that message. And as I sat there, I literally sat pen and paper, writing down a few words. And I said, I want, I'm a word person. I want to come up with a word that people can connect with. I played around with certain words. And then when I wrote smile, that's when the pen literally started automatic writing and i came up with smile the smile so what did you feel when you wrote smile what did you feel it felt complete it just felt like okay here's something it's a smile everybody will probably remember it it's a good to it's a good to have is all i thought of, of it at the moment but you know as i started presenting it in corporate spaces in at universities at home, you know, at, at sessions. That's how I re began to realize how beautifully it is seamless. I didn't really put, you, people put lots and lots of research behind TEDx ideas, but all I did was sit with myself and, and actually come up with this. But the more I presented it, the more I understood it. Right, so the thing is that takes a lot of courage to do what you did, especially for an adult. So what I was talking about that start with that nine, 10 year old gap, nine years old and younger, we're creative. We'll do stuff like what you just said, 10 years old, all of a sudden we're like, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sit down with a piece of paper and go, I want an answer because that person will make fun of me and that person will make fun of me. So we squash it, but it's all there. And the way to come up with these ideas, you know, I'm an inventor. I have three patents. I have dozens of trade secrets. I was the youngest inventor of the year in the history of this chemical company, Dow Chemical. And, and inventing is having the courage to go to, to talk out loud and to say these things and to write stuff down and cross it out, to write it down and cross it out. You know, you write down words and your unconscious brain's responding to it. And that's, and so you got to do that. If you're afraid of looking stupid, if you're afraid of looking silly, then your unconscious brain's sitting there going, buddy, you're missing out. I have all the answers. Let me yeah. out. I, I didn't know these things. I mean, even even the whole process of getting into the world of writing. I stood there one afternoon in front of that pile full of dishes and saying, there must be more to life than diapers and dishes. 
And there it came, like literally that afternoon itself, I'm sitting with my cup of tea and I open the newspaper and I read about the Dubai press club. And I'm like, okay, but they have a press club here. Let me call and ask them if they would like to uh, publish my poems. I, I used to write poetry at the time. I said, would they publish? And, and the, this lovely lady, I remember her name still, Sally. She picked up the phone, rich Australian accent, picks up the phone and she says, we don't publish poetry because that, you know that's not how it's done in media. But I do know a group of ladies who contributes to the local newspaper. You might want to get in touch with them. And voila. Well, there's that linked, you know, the thing I'm doing is linked. That's how that happens. But but I want to go back to something that's really important and, and subtle that I th don't know that a lot of people really get is you're standing there and you're saying these things, you know, there must be more than diaper dishes. There must be. So you say all these different things, right? But why did you settle on one of those things? It's because of the feeling. Mm -hmm. And that's how your unconscious brain communicates. So if you're waiting for something that makes logical sense that you can defend and, and you're never going to get there versus if you say a bunch of things and look for the feeling and the okay. settle, that's it, what most people don't do because they have wrong, the wrong model for the brain. It's interesting that you you said that because my in my logical idea was yes I have grown up in Kuwait I know how to read and write Arabic I could probably take tuitions I'd even got my flyers ready to be honest I thought I'd you know I'd I'd, uh, I'd tutor kids at home or something like that but then it just didn't speak to me enough it didn't feel it right yeah it didn't speak to me enough so uh, so this is where I am today Alhamdulillah. Yeah, so we do a lot of things by feeling. When somebody says, you know, hey, why don't you clean, you know, the house or or fix this thing? I don't feel like it. I don't have the energy to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't feel like it. That's our unconscious brain. And that's yeah. and that's where all the energy is. And so what I do is try I help people get their unconscious brain behind them because all your energy is in your unconscious brain. It's not anywhere else. And mm -hmm. if you don't know how to talk to it and get it in behind you, then you're, you're going into it. It's like a wind. Your unconscious brain is like a wind. It either can blow in your face and hold you back or get behind you and propel you. And that's really what I do because I have this model. Lovely. And I think the E is super important of, within the smile strategy as well, which is energize the possibilities. So what does that mean to you specifically? How do you describe that specifically? For me, it's about putting energy into possibilities. It's about getting the, the possibilities moving, whether it is with a task that you do, an intention that you have, some journaling that you do. You know, it's about putting energy into possibilities, connecting with someone. So what I liked about that phrase was the word possibilities. And the reason I asked yeah. you is I didn't know if you meant the same thing, you know, because you're the one who wrote it. I want to understand what you mean by the words you use. To me, what I liked about possibilities is you're not saying I know for sure this thing I'm going to yeah, do is no. going to work. It's a possibility. Yep. So try this, try that. So art therapy, I don't know mm -hmm. if you're familiar with art therapy, but art therapy is very much an unconscious brain thing. You go to draw something and you pick a certain color and go, eh, and you pick this color and you go to draw this and nah. And what you're doing is if you're really in touch with it, it's your unconscious brain expressing what it sees going on through that. And so energize the possibilities again was another unconscious brain thing. It's like do a couple things, but don't worry if it doesn't work. It's just a possibility, but yep. put some energy, take a step towards it, have the courage to take a step towards something that may not work. So like I said, yep. that L and that E, I, I don't know. I, I've seen a lot of consultants and I like to say 99% of them are hurting people. But I got to tell you that L and the E, everybody needs the first three. So I get what the consultants are doing. They're helping people with the first three. But if you don't have the L and the E, if you don't use the conscious brain to get people in touch with the unconscious, you are hurting people. And you have the L and the E. So that's why I was anxious to be on this. I really, I really don't like talking to consultants because it, it makes me sad because we need to get to resiliency. We need to get focused in order to flow. And so I'm very much about a flow. So flow is focusing and then letting go and that's you 
basically have a flow analogy here. Your first three is getting, you know, into focus and your next two is letting go. And that's, so I see a lot of flow in what you've written. So that's why I was like, oh, if I could be on the show, I would love it because you are one of the few consultants who are, is not hurting people. You are not hurting anybody with smile. Thank you. And a smile doesn't hurt, doesn't it? <laughs> so, um, uh, we have another question here. It says, what is your opinion about the old concept of the two, two triune. triune brain model? Is that still, does that still exist or is there a new model? I, the thing is, is I ask people what their model is for the mind and the brain and they will say there, there isn't one. And this triune model, you know, I, when I first created this model for the mind and the brain, I had it on one sheet of paper and I had all the parts of the brain labeled and I had like a hundred arrows. It looked like a wiring diagram. And on it, I put the triune model because what happened was one of the three psychology students I was working with wanted to present my information at a seminar. This is like 15 years ago. And they, the, they showed it to the professor. The professor wanted to meet with me. So I handed them the model and he looked at it and he got really angry that there was this triune model, you know, and some people call it like the, the Freud model or some of these models. He was really angry and he said, this was never supposed to be an explanation for the parts of the brain. It was just an analogy. And so he got really mad at that because physiologically it doesn't sync up to hmm. anything. It really covers several parts of the brain all in one. My model for the mind and brain you know, and, and I explain it this way, um, a, a very uh, models when they're the truth, they're very simple. They're very powerful. All of chemistry is built on Bohr's model for the atom. Mm -hmm. What is that model? The center of the nuclei, the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons and has 99% of the weight and is surrounded by electrons. That's all it is. That's, that's the model. The model for the solar system, you know, is the is the moon revolves around the earth and the earth revolves around the sun with all the planets in concentric orbits. Do you realize it took like 2000 years for people to figure out what I just said in, in 10 seconds? So likewise, I have a model for the mind and the brain that everything is built off. And this is simply what it is, is you are a driver in a car. You, the mind, your uniqueness, mind or soul, whatever, you, however you want to call it. You're intangible and you are a driver in a car. Your brain is the car. Now, in a car, you're only in direct control of 10% of that car. The steering wheel, the gas pedal, the brake, the radio, the windshield wipers. Not, likewise, you're only in control of 10% of your brain. People say you only use 10% of your brain. You use all your brain, but you're only in direct control of 10% of your brain. That's your conscious brain. That's like I said about the cell phone. 99% of that car is where all the behavior and all the energy is, and you don't directly control it. You aren't directly firing the engine. 90% of your brain is your unconscious. It's where all your behavior is. It's where all your energy is. You should be steering to direct it. The other consultants, here's what, what when they talk to somebody, because I say to somebody, if you were going to drive out of this parking lot, what would you do? Well, you'd get in the car, turn it on. You'd use the steering wheel to direct the engine out of the parking lot. That's, that's how, that's what smile is. Hmm. All these other consultants, here's what they're doing. There's, they're saying, rip the steering wheel out of the car, mm -hmm. tape the brake pedal to your foot, take your, take the gas pedal to your other foot and walk out of the parking lot and say, I'm driving. You can make it out of the parking lot with your conscious brain. You're not going to make it cross country. You can make it progress listening to these other consultants, but you're not going to make it through the, your entire life. You could make it through your entire life with smile because it's using your, you're using your conscious brain to direct your unconscious brain. So that's the real model. And I'm open to any models. I've said to people, you know, share me any model for the mind and the brain. But I have literally said this to these, to these people. When I, when I shared that with the psychology professor and he looked at it, he said, I'm going to say two things. He goes, number one, he goes, there's nothing on this sheet of paper we don't already know. Yeah. We know everything on the sheet of paper, but I've never seen it on one sheet of paper. He goes, we study discrete parts of the brain. Each part is labeled. We look at a part of the brain and we say stuff happens 
and it damages his brain. That's why you have bad behavior. You're saying that there's four circuits in the brain and you operate according to one of those four. So inside and the behavior comes out. He goes, so the second thing I'm going to say is, he goes, this isn't how we do science. Stop doing this. Stop helping people. This is wrong. So I kept helping people in private and I knew I couldn't publicly talk about this model because I, I sounded crazy. Yeah. Then in 2015, uh, a neuroscience magazine came out and the editor in the front said, here's what we learned in 2015. The big thing we learned was that behavior, we shouldn't have been um, studying discrete parts of the brain. We should have been looking at neural circuits. And at that point, I said to my wife, can we talk about this model publicly now? Because, you know, we, we're ahead of medical science. So I've got a six years head start right now. Next year, it'll be seven or, or four year head start. I actually have a uh, four year head start. Next year, it'll be three. But seven years ago, I had this model and neuroscience was just beginning. I'll tell you another quick story is when I was working with those psychology students 15 years ago, I used to say to them, ask your psychology professor how to make people happy. Hmm. Every psychology person in, in the United States 15 years ago, their answer to that was, it's not our job to help people be happy. It's our job to help people stop doing bad behavior. I can show you how to be happy. The thing is that, and I'll, I'll explain in a second. The thing is, is that about seven years ago, the psychologists and these people are now studying happiness. Now there's a whole field of happiness. All happiness is, is your, your brain um, putting out pleasure chemicals in response to your context. And there's a very simple equation, experiencing effects that exceed expectations. So if you're expecting $20 and I give you nothing, you're not going to be happy. If you're expecting $20 and I give you 40, your brain will kick out chemicals. Notice, you know, the thing is, is, is it was all it, part of that's the context. Now flip it around. If, if I, if I was give if I gave you $20 and you expected nothing, you'd be happy. If I gave you $20 and you expected 40, you'd be sad. So there's two things that affect your happiness, where you put your brain before you experience your context. So some people go, I'm just going to make a lot of money. I'm going to be the most beautiful person. I'm going to boss a bunch of people. They think if they master their context, they'll be happy. You can't master your context. So then they think they'll never be happy. Actually, if you know how to put your brain, your unique brain in the right spot before anything, you'll always have those chemicals. But do you understand your unique brain or your uniqueness? That's why I was able to do this. I'm not worried about anybody doing this instead of me. First of all, I'd love it if everybody helped everybody be happy. But second of all, if people can't explain who you uniquely are, not a personality test, but who you uniquely are, they're never going to help you intentionally be happy. Hmm. I'm just going to let that like let that sink in for a bit because that is so, so powerful. I mean, a lot of us do not know who we are. We come from a place of conditioning. We come from a place of ego. We come from different tangents. We don't know who we are. And we think everybody, we think we're all the same. And so we think the way we think is the way everybody else thinks. So what your mom did is what, uh, what every parent does. Your mom was like, this is the way I think. This is the way everybody thinks. So, and she's trying to help you be a doctor because this will make sense. But she didn't know she thinks this way, you think this way. And so what I try to do, my number one goal in education is this. I believe that the goal of education should be every kid should understand how they uniquely learn, which includes how they uniquely motivate themselves. If, yeah. if a kid graduates school knowing how they learn and how they motivate themselves, they're going to be successful in whatever they choose to do. But yeah. we want everybody to learn this stuff. And so what happens is, is I'll have kids who say to me, why do I need to learn geometry? Hmm. And I'll say to them, you know what? Maybe you don't. Maybe you'll never use it. But do you know how you uniquely learn and how you motivate yourself? It sounds like you're having a tough time motivating yourself with geometry. It sounds like 
Geometry is an opportunity for you to learn about yourself. So now notice, if I try to get that kid to learn geometry, he's not going to learn it and he won't learn anything about himself. If I teach the kid to use geometry to learn about himself, he learns about himself and he learns geometry, which is your L and your E. I call it the backward step. Your L and your E is the key. How did I teach this kid geometry? Not by trying to teach him geometry. I tried to teach him about himself and the effect was that. Your S, M, and I sets you up and then the L and the E gives you the effect of it. And that's why that is so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hmm, we've got, um, we've got somebody watching. I, it's uh, her, the handle is I and you matter. She says, hi, John, nice to see you. Great show. Alex says he's proud of you. Zara, that's Zara. Oh. The, uh, she's an interesting story. She did one of the biggest favors for me because I can't go into the schools and tape me talking to any kids. Okay. Okay. Her son is autistic. He, um, basically tried to go to two different schools last year. So now he's home. And she asked me if I would talk to him and teach him his uniqueness, really smart kid. And she videotaped it and it's oh. it's online well he comes in and sits down like this well the the first three minutes of the video is me telling her exactly what i'm gonna do and me working with her to figure out she knows her son we figure out he's administrator perceiver so he's like you and i except he's a perceiver so instead of explaining everything he says one sentence this 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 really smart really poetic okay he's sitting like this and she goes don't you want to and and he won't look at me or nothing and I started talking to his unconscious brain about being an administrator. No joke. He goes, and I taught him for five minutes. There's adults that won't let me teach him for five minutes. And he just took off from there because he knows who he is and he knows how to direct it. The, the issue is he's, he's not going to fit into everybody be nice. Everybody act like this. Yep. He's, he's very smart. He's got these ideas. And, and so I'm going to say this, this, this will be the last thing I say. I know, I know the time and everything, but you're an administrator. I'm an administrator. I'm, I'm interested in what you think about this being in different cultures, but I like to say the best day of every administrator's life is when they graduate from school, because we want to coordinate and mm -hmm. we're not allowed to coordinate anything. And administrators have a miserable time in school because they're just a kid and you're not supposed to coordinate anything. And the minute we graduate college, everybody goes, would you coordinate this? And we're like, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. So to help him understand that he's an administrator, to help him understand it's not his fault that his teachers are, are hindering his uniqueness and showing him ways to get his uniqueness. To, so one of the big things, I'll, I'll tell you this with administrators, to give us energy. We need a goal or we need to hear someone else's goal. So what I would mm -hmm. tell your kids is, is if your mom ever looks like she doesn't have energy, either say to her, what's your goal? Or talk about your goal in front of her. And you'll probably notice that now. Whenever anybody talks about their goal, you're like, oh, I, we get I energy. Mean, gosh. You know, um, John, you know, we spoke some time back about how if you have an expectation and you give people a little bit more than maybe they get, they get happy, right? So I'm wondering, would it be of value if we could give people a few more minutes than an hour? Because they did come expecting an hour. But would you have the time on you? Um, would you have the time on you to share yes. a little bit more than an hour? Yeah. Guys, if, you, if you're willing to hear us out, because I could go on talking with John forever. Well, but that there, quick, did it? Yes, did that that's how like it an hour? Nope, it that's didn't. Slow. And that's what it just, slow is. This this was this is like the shortest one hour I've ever had, and um, no kidding, guys. Please type in comments saying a yes if if you would like for us to carry on because I still have a few questions for John, and there is another question that has come in that I would love to uh, take up with him. Um, so Kelsey also says thank you for joining for providing this value to us, John and Rukaya. Thank you so much for joining. And guys, if you're new here on the platform, do subscribe to the channel because this. I won't say this is the kind of conversation because each one of my speakers is a star, but this is the kind, these are the kind of value conversations that we have here. And of course, my daily videos. So um, you spoke about goals. 
you spoke about, uh, you know, when I acquired my PCC earlier this year, and I was so thrilled with ticking it off my, my to-do list for the year, I actually went back to my cohort and I started chasing after my peers saying, guys, you need to submit this. Guys, you need to submit your work. You need to get this done. So I've been uh, pushing forward with my, with my team members saying, you need to get your submissions done. You need to tick this off. So I completely hear you when you talk about goals. Right, so the thing is, is how do you motivate them to get a goal? So I'll, I'll tell you, half of the people in the world are what we call a server how. You and I are not server hows, okay? But here's how I here's and and here's how I explain it is do, do these two sentences feel different to you? Is what I'd say to somebody. I'd say, you need to drive me to the gas station because I my car broke down. Or my car broke down and I'm gonna need a ride to the gas station. All the servers go, I'm never driving you. And the next one is like, get, where's my keys? I need, I need to get going. So what happens is when people have, so you have two kids and I'm not saying that they're one of each, but what tends to happen is, is when, when I talk to parents, I say, okay, if you have two or more kids, one of your kids is probably very ambitious. They get things done. You know, they set up pillows and teach them. They, you know, you don't have to tell them what to do. They're very ambitious. They get things done, but they don't seem to get along with people. And one of your kids, they get along with everybody. You can't seem to get them to do anything on time. And they think they're going to get by in this world on their personality. Okay. That first kid is not a server how. They're a teacher how or they're a perceiver how. The second kid is a server how. So the problem is, is if you tell people you need to do this and they're a server how, they're not doing it. And so what parents will do is if they have a kid who's a server how, they'll go, get your work done. And the kid's like, no, they'll start screaming at them. No, they'll make a life unbearable. The kid will do it. And then they'll say, do you see what I had to do to my kid to get him to do it? If you say, I need you to get that work done. And, and the story I always tell her is, is there's this guy, he had a 13 year old son, his giver server. So his server, he's sitting on the bed. His wife walks in and goes, Caleb, get in the car right now. You're going to be late. He doesn't move a muscle. She walks out and goes, her husband goes, fix this. Well, he, he learned this information from me. He walked in, he goes, Caleb, I'm leaving. I need you in the car. He gets up and walks out and the wife goes, that's what I said to him. And he goes, no, you didn't. Oh, no, you didn't. So when you want to get people to do stuff, realize half the time, but the problem is a parent, we don't want to say I need, I'm the parent. I don't mm. need anything. You're the kid. Okay. But so I need you to do this. I need this, half of the class will get it done if they're the servers. And then it's how the other people, like you and I are, are, are teacher house. So if you explain, you know, you and I, if we give you the explanation, you need to do this because of this. Hmm. And that's probably what you said to him is, is being a teacher out. This is what I'd say is you guys need to get this in or otherwise you're going to be late. That's a teacher. Perceiver, yeah. Zara's son would go, you need to get it done. If you uh -huh. meet anybody who says that, that's what a perceiver looks like. And I don't listen to them. <laughs> but and and before we get further into the conversation, we have Alex watching us. A big shout out to you, Alex. Hi, thanks for joining. Hi, Alex. Yes. And Maria Kunen, everybody says yes, we should carry on talking. Um, so thank you, Zara, for calling him and, and so that he can join us. We have a question. Question is on um just a sec, it's gone up a little bit. Yeah, so explain, could you explain the difference between identity, ego, and super ego? Wow, so wow. here's the thing. If, uh, if um, in my car analogy, the, the ego would be like your left foot, like your, your right foot, the gas pedal and the line to the carburetor. So that's what ego is. So it's very much a conscious brain thing, but there's some things in there that are good and things are bad. So, because it's like, is ego good or bad? So the closest yeah. thing to ego is your conscious brain. So what's happening with your, with your conscious brain is, 
is you are making this decision. You that's your your uh, um, free will. Your free will is in your conscious brain. You can lie. Your unconscious brain can't lie, but you can use your conscious brain to lie. So your ego is like your conscious brain. It's basically, although the, the explanation for ego goes into unconscious and it goes into your mind and soul. But, but what I'm going to say is this, is that when you are using your conscious brain to get something in opposition to reality, that's a bad ego. When you are using your conscious brain to assert yourself in your identity, that's a good thing. So, but, but the ego is really a, a flawed analogy because it's not really covering just the conscious brain. It's covering the conscious brain and part of the unconscious and part of the, uh, the mind and the soul. Okay. The ID, the, the id is really like the, the first cause, like where you're coming from. But the problem is, is people measure that by behavior. Hmm. So I like to say, I'm John, I drive a CRV. If I left the parking lot and I skidded, what would it, what would you sound like if you called me skid from now on? John, you're skid. I'm not skid. That's my behavior. So if you think about it, when we say he's an abuser, he's not an abuser. If he is first cause an abuser, then all he'll ever be able to do is abuse. So when we identify people's identity by their behavior, we take away their free will. Hmm. And then all they can ever do is abuse. If you understand who they are, I'm John. And that was a behavior and I'm in control of it. Likewise, oh, you're CRV. I'm not CRV, I'm John. CRV is my car. So when someone says they, they have, they are, they're bipolar, they're ADHD, that's their brain. That's not who they are. So ideally that it should be who you really are. But the problem is with identity, all these measures have gone into basically this behavior stance and, and that stuff is flawed. If you think about it, there's two things that prevent happiness. So experience effects exceed expectations. Experience and effect means it happens to you. It's an effect. It's not a cause. So control would prevent that half. So if you think you need to take more control to be happy, you blocked half of happiness. Exceed expectation. What's the expectation you can never exceed? Perfection. Mm -hmm. Control and perfection block happiness. Two of the four personalities are control and perfection. So taking a personality test and operating according to it will block your ability to be happy. So that's why with, with that id, and then that superego is just this, I would say they're trying to cover the unconscious brain with that because it is, it is so much bigger than your conscious brain. Okay. It's nine times bigger. So it's their explanation of that. But a lot of times they use the word subconscious. Yes. So the, I labeled the model of the mind and the brain with subconscious. And that psychology professor said, well, you got one thing wrong on this. So on my whole sheet, there was one thing wrong. And he explained to me, and a lot of people get this wrong. Your subconscious is in your conscious. So your conscious is what you can immediately access. access. Your subconscious is something you takes a second to access. So what was the name of your first pet? That is in your subconscious. You can still access it. Your unconscious is something you can't access. I cannot directly access how many people were in the restaurant yesterday when I went to lunch, but that number is in my unconscious. Yeah. So there's a difference between the sub and the un, and a lot of people talk about sub and they really mean un. And that's where I think the superego stuff gets, gets thrown off. So, so th those three parts are, are trying to cover more than just those three parts of the brain. Super. Hmm. Tell us about flow. And then I have another question. I am sorry. How much time do you have to go? Oh, I, got, I got time. I actually thought this was on later than this. So flow is when you are feeling and operating at your best. You're actually, it's not a thought process. You're actually toggling between your unconscious and your conscious. You're flowing back and forth between them. So you get control in your conscious, then you give up control to your unconscious, then you get control. A lot of people out there think it is a thought process. 
it's not. It's actually a hack between two thought processes. So everybody's got a unique way that they get into flow. And so that's what I do is I help people find their unique process for flow or their flow sets. That's the name of the company. Flow flow sets. Sets. I believe we're the only company in the world that can help people do find their unique process. Because once you find it, you can apply it to everything. Wouldn't you like to flow in everything you do? Like we're flowing here. Wouldn't you like to do it? More importantly, wouldn't you like to be able to pull other people into flow? Like that's what I do is, is, is I, if I go and interview, I want to get in the flow and then I want to get you in the flow and then we're flowing. And then you go, Hey, I, that didn't feel like an hour. So that's what I do is I teach people how to get themselves in flow. And then I teach people how to get other people in flow. What's my passion is education. Who needs this more than anybody? Teachers. I mean, if, if a teacher can get a, in flow, they're going to have so much energy, they'll finish the school year with more. And if they can get the kids in flow, the kids will learn so much better. So this is what I want to do. I don't care what country this goes into. I want all these teachers to help all these kids flow. So yeah, flow is where you're feeling and, and performing your best. Lovely. Now we are talking about flow. And one thing that I, I had told my children when they flew out was to be um, honest with their identity. And I said in, in, in this order, identity, your health, and then your education, although they were flying out for their education, I said, you be honest with your identity first. Now, I believe that identity is created from the values that you have. Right. I, well, I think I think I would say you're who you are, your nature, you know, I believe you're born with that. Your identity, it depends how you define identity, because I work with some schools that define identity with how other people view you. No, no, no. I'm talking about your own inner self, who you yeah, are. So your inner you self, you I believe your values will come out as an effect of your identity if you're true to it. So your advice was perfect because hmm. the closer you get to who you are, the closer the, the positive values will come out. You know, the way okay. you love is not the way I love. True. But the thing I, is, is if you operate from your uniqueness, it's going to be love. It's going to be truth. It's going to be, you know, you know, life. It's going to be all these things. So I believe from the uniqueness that'll come out when you're surrounded by these values, the thing is, is that you can learn some of them quicker than others, but you might have to adjust them. You know, I like to say everybody 50 percent, you know, of your life is is who you is, is what you experienced. And 50 percent is how you addressed it or how you dealt with it. Well, if you know who you are, you know, mm -hmm. all I try to do with people is I try to get people to the place where I say to them, whatever happens in your life. How would you handle it if you were more you? Hmm. That's how you get in the flow. Is if you know right. who you are, then whatever happens to me, if I'm more me, but that was the advice you gave. And I want to say, share something real quick about the second step. If you know who you are, you'll you'll more likely to be mentally and emotionally sound, and it will be easier to be healthy. Yep. So the issue is, is when people have health issues, they treat it mentally, you know, what, what we've learned, like how we deal with cancer is people get counseling and they're starting to find out that people were depressed and then they got cancer versus they got cancer and got depressed. So if you want to get healthy and you're not mentally and emotionally healthy, it's going to be a lot of effort, but you can do it. If you're mentally, and emotionally healthy, it doesn't take much effort to get physically healthy. So your order I love your order again, and it probably settled you because it was the truth, but that's the order to do it is know yourself. The first thing is if you know who you are and then mm. you operate from it, you understand it and you, you communicate it, you operate from it. All these other things are in effect. And then it's really easy to pick up your virtues and values and everything and to do them right. So, but do values evolve is, is what I wanted to understand. And we have another question. I but would say values evolve. evolve you know, because certain values are more important to you than others. They're closer mm. to who you are than others. Okay. So the identity also evolves then. Right. 
Right. And I think what happens is, is, is you, you get, you get closer. I think your discovery of it gets closer. So I think it was always there, but the thing is, is my identity isn't your identity. And so what I do, the number one way to grow to self-esteem is to know your identity and communicate it to someone who knows theirs. Because when you do that, you suddenly go, oh, I really am this person because I am not that person. And you like that I'm this person? Oh, because you don't want to do this thing? And so that's where you get to high self-esteem. And high self-esteem is this, is when somebody affirms you, you don't feel better about yourself. You feel better about the other person. So I'm sure we all have areas in our life where somebody says, hey, you're really great at this. And you go, yeah, I am great at this. That didn't make me feel any better about me, but I'm impressed that you recognize that. I feel better about you. You are fully confident in who you are in that area to the point that you can't go any higher. No one can affirm you into feeling better. Now it's turned outwards and that's the key. I said, you learn more when you teach stuff that's outwards. Yeah. It Joy is your brain releasing pleasure chemicals regardless of your context. How do you experience joy? By loving. I believe love is giving without expecting anything in return. If I give to somebody without expecting anything in return, my unconscious gives pleasure chemicals to me. So we got to get to the stage where we're looking outward. But you can't just get there. If you're not secure in yourself, you can't do that. But that's the goal is you get secure in yourself and then you look outwards and you actually have more energy and you flow more. Beautiful. And I say... You, you find your joy when you stop chasing happiness. Happiness is contextual. Anybody's happy finding $20 in the parking lot, but it's only going to last for 48 hours or 72 hours. It's only going to last as long as your unconscious or as your uh, short term memory. Exactly. But loving your unconscious will keep it going beyond that. Absolutely. And this leads us to, I think, the last question for the evening, which is equally powerful why do we get trapped into judging self and others does this happen in flow state as well it does not happen in a flow state this is an amazing question i'm gonna teach a little bit okay Please but we're over time so so i want you to follow this because it's really important and this was in the book blink there was a there was a study done where they had four decks of cards and people could pick any deck and flip the card over and they won or lost the money that the card said. Now, two decks had a red back to them and two decks had a blue back. And what the people didn't know was the red back decks had big winners, big losers, but more losers than winners. It was dangerous. Hmm. The blue decks had little winners, little losers, and more winners than losers. It was safe. After 10 flips, everybody's unconscious brain knew the red deck was dangerous right. for 10 flips for them unconscious to know that after 40 flips their behavior changed so after 40 flips they stopped picking the red deck as much they still picked it but not as much at mm. 80 flips they said consciously that red deck is dangerous and what i like to say is right there i just taught you everything you will ever need to know about your behavior and the behavior of other people. So to answer your question, I wanted to get that background. So now here's the answer to your question. When my behavior changes at 40 flips, I don't see it till 80, but everybody else in the world sees it. And mm -hmm. so when you walk up to me at 40 flips and say, hey, John, you know your behavior changed, I don't see it. But what I, when I say I don't see it, here's what I'm really saying to you. You know what? Because I'm not at 80 flips, you know, you're not talking to me at, at 80, I'm at 40. So when I say I don't see it, what I'm saying is, hey, look it, leave me alone and let me keep doing this bad behavior until I get to 80. Let me do it 40 more times until I get to 80 and then let me complain about how hard it is to change my behavior. So here's the question I ask people when I get them in groups. Do you want to be judged for your intentions or your behavior, your actions? Mm -hmm. Anybody who says they want to be judged for their actions is lying. 
Because what that means is if you say, I just want to be judged for your actions, your actions change at 40 ahead of your intentions. So the next time you do something wrong and you didn't realize it and someone confronts you, you can't explain why you did it. You can't give an excuse. You just have to say, nope, I did it. So if you accidentally say something racist, you just have to go, I'm a racist. No one wants to be judged for the behavior. Everybody wants to be judged for their intentions. Everybody wants to go, but here's why I did it. Here's, you don't understand. Now, do you judge other people for their actions or their intentions? Here's the problem in the world. Mic drop. Here's the problem in the world. All of us have a 40 flip gap between our intentions and our actions. All of us want the benefit of the doubt for that gap. And all of us want to deny everybody else in the world the benefit of the doubt for that gap. So that's where, that's where you have. And I'll give you a real simple example about this. What, this is what I do in the class with the kids. I'll say, when somebody is wrong and they admit they're wrong, if I was wrong and I said, hey, I was wrong to do that, do you think more of me, less of me, or the same? Do you go, wow, that guy's a horrible person? No. no. Why do you think everybody's going to think less of you when you admit you're wrong? This is what being a human is. If we were a computer, we wouldn't have a 40 flip gap. We're humans. We have a 40 flip gap and we need to understand what people mean. That's why when I asked you about possibilities, I said, explore or uh, energize the possibilities. What do you mean by that? I wasn't going to pretend to go. I know what you mean by that. You mean this. No, Anything's what was possible. your intention? Right. Yep. And that's what I try to do and try to teach people is I need to first understand somebody before I judge them. I, you know, I judge these consultants and I was judging you like crazy until you got to the L <laughs> and then I went, Oh, I was wrong. I was wrong about her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gosh. Yes, we do judge people. And uh, I, that's where communication goes wrong, right? You, you assume stuff. You don't, you don't go on to ask. You don't go on to understand whether you got it right. That's so important to understand whether you've listened to what they said. Right. You received the same thing. So we've received a lot and lot and lots of value today. The reality of how your brain works was fabulous. Uh, you literally demonstrated it with me. Uh, so thank you. I learned so much today on this conversation, and I'm sure everyone else did too. Uh, what is one thing that um, the listeners are going to be taking home as a takeaway from this conversation? Because we can't just give them everything and let them go. It's all about teaching. So what are you going to teach yourself to do from what you've picked up from this conversation? Just a quick comment in, in, uh, would be nice so that you are saying it out because that's what uh, John has, has been telling us about. That's how it works. So just a quick comment in what are you going to apply in from this conversation? And uh, John, what would you like to share as closing comments? Before we I would just up. like everybody to remember that you are a human. You are not a robot. You're not going to get ahead by going directly at anything and all this effort. You need to you need to state these things and get these things out so your unconscious brain knows that. And then you need to let it go, let things go, and you need to explore. The, you have they need to have the courage to explore the possibilities. Beautiful. So we're going to uh, we're going to let those comments coming in, come in. Maybe you need to think it over. So thank you once again, everyone, for joining. Thank you, John, for joining and for the extra time that you gave us. You definitely made us happy because the expectation was different and you gave us more than we expected. Thank you so much. And again, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day, the evening, wherever you are in the world. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.